Discover how you can green your life by building a knowledge base of current sustainable and eco-savvy trends. This series will delve into hot topics, current standards and practices, ways to design better spaces, and specify materials that benefit not only us as consumers, but the world as a whole. Members of Caragreen, as sustainable materials distributors, and other industry leaders weigh in throughout the series. This is Build Green, Live Green. Hi, this is Jessica with Build Green, Live Green, Caragreen's podcast on healthy building materials and what's happening in the sustainable building materials industry. And today I have with me Emma Abramowitz with Source. Emma, can you um, introduce everyone to Source and, and talk a little bit about, you know, kind of how you guys came into being and how your business models changed over time? Yeah. Thanks for having me, Jessica. Um, yeah. So I, I work on the on the sales side um, at Source. I'm also on the facility side, which I'll get into more of what that entails. But Source started about three years ago in Portland, Oregon. And at that time, we were crowdsourced. So we're now source, www.tothesource.com. And we we were headquartered in Portland. We started there at that time, three years ago. We were working really closely with the local materials reps and growing our physical library there. But in recent years and really like around the start of the pandemic, we started building our digital tools. So really sources twofold. We have physical local shared locations where designers can see products and see materials in person. But then we also have a digital catalog where we host a lot of different product data from all the brands who have um, accounts with us. So, so your clients would be you know, architects and designers who are looking for information on, on different products. So you're kind of consolidating, you're almost, I guess I would say in the last several years, probably a decade, to be honest, a lot of design firms have just decided to develop their own digital libraries. And you're kind of taking that shift and consolidating it in, in one you know, giant digital library. Exactly. Yeah. We like to think of the digital catalog as like the infinite library, right? There's like infinite real estate and infinite space to host data and information. And then, you know, as you know, in, in design firms, there's usually like a set place to have a physical library, but we're starting to see the trend of those libraries downsizing and being more inspirational or actually some firms have just completely done away with their firms and they now outsource and use um, products like Source and others to find their product information. And I, I think I think that makes a lot of sense now too, because digitally you can segment stuff a lot better. You you can you can kind of put it in different. A lot of libraries will have you know finishes or division you know you know this division twelve here and division nine there, but then you can't also have has recycled content has an HPD you know has calculated embodied carbon. You can't kind of carve it up any other way rather than what it physically is. So you might have 30 solid surface options there, but you don't know that Durad is the only one that has high recycle content or something like that, right? Exactly. I like to explain our model is we basically take the traditional materials library and make it smart and make it do more for you. So by having products in stock, designers can see basically when they're on their online account, they can see what's available to them within their local library, you know, like what's in stock in my local resource center, but then they can see everything else. So by making the, you know, these products smarter, they can then find that specific SKU within the digital database. They can find the spec information. They can find their local rep. They can find the sustainability docs. Really, it's just like one place. So like one, one QR code, one barcode can bring them into this world of lots of information. So, yeah, and you just mentioned something, too. It's not just the information. It's the physical samples as well. So yeah. you're also this kind of like sample warehouse at the same time. So here's all your information. And also, you know, when you need to touch and feel it, as we know designers do, you guys have, have all of that in, in place. Yes, yes. So the goal of Source is that it's a place where you can discover materials, both online and in person. It's a place where you can find all the product information and right, like holistically from yeah. my rep cell phone number to like, what is this made out of? Yeah. Um, but now we've also launched a procurement offering where now designers can start to procure products and furnishings through our platform and through our services. 
as well. Okay. So discover, um, spec, and procure. Okay, so 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 I get kind of the online presence. It's it's pretty clear what what service that provides to architects and designers, but also this you know let's talk a little bit about post pandemic and the plans that you had for physical locations too, because the theory was you know people are going to want to come to you know if people are getting rid of their physical libraries there should be one consolidated space. It can't just be online, but a place they could come and physically touch the samples, put them next to each other, see how they look, you know, see how the textures are and, and put together a palette and collaborate. So how did the pandemic slow that, exacerbate that? Yeah. So right at the start of the pandemic, we had actually just moved into a much bigger space in Portland, Oregon. And at that time we had one space in Portland. It's about two times the size of our old space. We did a TI. We partnered with a design firm in Portland, and we were really excited to open it. And then the plan was we were going to expand into other states. But when the pandemic hit, we moved and we had to shut down. So it's like our TI finished and we couldn't even open. So we decided to put the physical spaces on pause and really spend our time creating digital project tools. So we not only did we increase a lot of different brands on the platform so that designers had more to source from, but we also enhanced our project tools where designers can compare products quicker and also visualize their mood boards in different ways. So it is, the platform is free. So any designer across the US can make their source account um, it is a contract grade commercial platform. So that is one of the prerequisites of having an account is that designer or that contractor, you know, that specifier needs to work on commercial projects. But then once you create an account and are granted access, you can find the products, interact with the brands and start to use the project tools as well. So then behind this, there has to be an economic model. So someone's paying for something. So if the designers aren't paying to be on the platform, is it the manufacturers who are paying to be on the platform? How is that yeah, working? Yeah, so we actually have two uh, partnership levels with manufacturers, one that is free and one that is paid. And there's I won't go into the, a lot of the differences between those, but the manufacturers have the option of partnering with us at a paid level, which gives them more of a heightened experience on source and it displays more product data with that brand on the platform. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and of course, you know, Kara Green's familiar with that because, you know, we've, we've engaged yep. with you. Yeah. And I think, you know, with any of these platforms, one of the most important things is critical mass. So I think offering the free profile is really, really important because you've got to get that critical mass and then, you know, having the paid option for people to kind of gain more visibility and, and provide more information or maybe get found more easily, you know, that that's kind of up to each brand, but you've made the cost of entry you know, minimal so that, that brands can be on your platform so you can get to critical mass much more quickly. Yeah. Which leads me to um, mm -hmm. another uh, platform, Material Bank, which is, it's heavy. Well, it started out very heavy on, on the sample fulfillment side, kind of just-in-time samples for designers. And I think your platform is a little probably more experiential than, than you know, the fulfillment side. But can you talk about some of the differences between the, the two platforms? I, I like to think of all these online platforms as complementary, like really, yeah. you know, sitting alongside each other. Um, so can you kind of talk about Material Bank and how you compare? Yes. I like to say that it's like we're cousins, like we're related companies. We're similar, but we're not exactly the same. And so three of the biggest differences are um, now that we've launched our procurement offering. So that's one of the biggest differences. Mm -hmm. The other is... Um, our human powered services. So in each of our physical locations across the US, we have staff that works out of that location and helps designer find products. And, and they're sort of thought of as um, materials assistance on okay. a project so that designers can sort of outsource some time consuming research work that is inherent in the design process. There's obviously tons of different questions that come up when you're designing. So our staff assist designers on their projects. And then the third is really the price point for manufacturers so that it is more equitable and it, it gives more brands a seat at the table, right? So, because, you know, at the end of the day, designers want everything. They want to see their local makers. They want to see, you know, like the big brands, they want to see a range of different products. Mm -hmm. 
And so we try to make it equitable for, for many different types of manufacturers to have a place. On the and, and one of the, so that kind of led me to two different questions, but one is about, you know, Material Bank does not have physical locations and they're really kind of heavy logistically with their proximity to FedEx and, and, and things like that. But their physical location is like a robotic, you know, warehouse. But you're talking about these collaborative spaces. And I want to talk about that a little bit because I've heard so many different data points about, you know, only 25% of designers think they're going to go back to work in person full time. Mm -hmm. So here's all these people at home, but these people need to collaborate. And you can do that online. But if someone wants to say, you know, I want this color yellow with, you know, a bright blue, they want to see them together. It's really hard to do that online. I mean, I know that people send me pictures all the time oh, you know, this, look at, here's my Durat install. And I'm like, I have no idea what color that is because my screen looks different than your screen. So screens aren't going to do it. So you kind of need to have these physical spaces. And with people staying at home, certain firms downsizing their office, less collaborative space, you guys building these physical locations enable that type of collaboration. So can you talk about kind of what the impetus is behind those places and where they're going to roll out and what we can expect as far as, you guys connecting with, you know, firms in Portland or, or Phoenix or wherever to yeah. um, really roll out the, the to the source model? Yeah, so we have, there's four libraries currently open. So we have one in Portland, which I mentioned, Seattle, Washington, Phoenix, Arizona, Honolulu, Hawaii, Chicago, Illinois, and then New York City will be opening up in Q1 of 2022. So that one's forthcoming. But the idea is that each of these locations, not only do they help us expand our national footprint, but they also serve as community hubs where not only designers can come see products, but reps can also use our spaces and the two can collaborate and work with each other. They're really thought of as like touchdown spaces, right? So if a rep is on a business trip and they don't have an office in Honolulu, they can use our space. They can come work there. They can host meetings there. They can host CEUs there. And then conversely for designers, we really tried to make the most flexible system for them. So whether they order the sample through source, whether they ask our staff to pull options. So they may say like, hey, Andrew, I need a range of different yellow fabrics. Can you pull them for me? And I'm gonna come drive over and I'm gonna see them in person before I order samples. Yep. Or conversely now, we at the start of the pandemic we launched same day sample delivery so conversely if a designer couldn't come into our space we can pull things that we have in stock and bring it to them so again like flexibility is key in these spaces because there's no one solution that'll fit everyone's workflow and so if i'm an architect or a designer or a manufacturer am i able to come to you and say hey source i want to have an event i want to have a cocktail hour or are you going to host events where you invite manufacturers to come in and interact with architects and designers when it's when it's time? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, currently the libraries are open by appointment only mm -hmm. because it's weird times. But yeah, the idea is that 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 manufacturers can host events there. The caveat being that they are um, reserved for our pro brands. So okay. right, so they get first right of refusal on on any sort of programming that they want to do in our spaces. But we do try to make them equitable again so that there's a range of different meetings and um, events going on in those spaces. Okay. And then I had two kind of last questions here as we, as we wrap this up. One, you said they come to you with questions and looking for solutions. And I've never been in this industry at a time where people needed solutions more than they do now because projects are waiting for materials. And lead time has become a massive issue with all these supply chain constraints and container ships stuck at port and yeah. containers stuck in China or India or Brazil, wherever they are. Yeah. And we get designers calling us all the time saying, Kara Green, I can't get this. What do you have? Just show me some options that you have. And we're getting that as a distributor just on kind of the surfacing side of things. What are you seeing at, you know, having the whole, you know, design library are you getting questions about lead times and in-stock items and what people can get? Yes, absolutely. That is one of the leading questions that we get is, I need it fast. Like We just had um, a contractor in Hawaii submit a request saying that 
you know, like I received 50% of this product, we have installed it and the other 50% is on back order. And so they're like, find me something that looks like it. It's going to be literally, but I need at the end of October, right? So it's, it's a big problem everywhere. And if you can imagine on an island in Honolulu, that's even harder, like that there's even more complications there. So yeah, lead time is crucial right now. That's something that we're looking at adding on our platform too, is like a quick ship filter that's come up quite a few times so that you can quickly find things um, that have a lower lead time. Well, and, and, you know, made in the USA, that is an automatic lead time. So, so talk about some of the filters, you know, that I mean, Care Green's focused on sustainability, you know, healthy building materials. That's kind of our shtick, but We've tr- we've gone to our brands because we try to partner with brands and let them know this is the minimum amount of documentation that you need to be successful as the world transitions online. So you can't just sit there with an MSDS and think that you're covered. You need an HPD now. You need may- you know maybe an LCA, maybe an EPD, depends on the firm. But we're working with our brands to make sure that they're providing those documents. But can you talk about the shift to sustainability and some of the um, the documents and filters that are on your website? Yeah. So sustainability has always been a part of our model all the way down to even our physical locations. I mean, when we, when we pick a location, we actually try to select one that doesn't even need a TI because we don't want to continue perpetuating that waste. Right. But when it comes to filters and data on our digital platform, when we redesigned our product listings, we made a modal at the top, at the very top. So basically it's like an image and then right below are all of the downloads. So if the manufacturer has an EPD or an HPD or lead or green guard, any of those sort of certificates would show up right below that product image and it's standardized across all the products. So what's great about that is it's reliable. So designers quickly know where to find it and it shows up straight away at the top of the page. Oftentimes on all of these manufacturers' websites, they have the information, which is great, but it can be hard to find it. And they're not all the same, right? We get that. So we try to standardize the listing so it's easy to find. And then our filters, we have quite a few different filters. Some of the, there's obviously like the traditional ones, like you mentioned, some made in the USA. We also have made in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we have a B Corp, certified B Corp. We yeah. have a certified woman-owned business. So there's a lot of different types of social and sustainability filters. And those definitions of the filters can be found on our homepage under the help section. They're all defined there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I like to, I like to tell people that, you know, if, if I'm a designer and I click has HPD and you're and you don't have one, you're gone. You've been, yeah. you've been filtered out and it's not something that can happen necessarily in a physical design library. So a lot of brands have never experienced this online filtering that is just going to take them out of consideration. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we've even seen it in Portland where firms, where we've helped them build their new library Mm -hmm. and they have asked us to find products specifically that have or or meet a certain level of sustainability impact and criteria. So there's firms that aren't, are, are, are literally not including some brands because they don't have that information. That's, 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 uh, not surprising. It's a trend I think we're seeing now. We're going to continue to see. And I'm excited about you guys. I think my first experience with you was someone handed me a, I think it was a notebook at Greenbuild and it said <laughs> VE this with a very memorable symbol on the cover. So I was really excited about the direction you guys are going. It's great to see you grow like this. I want to see a source in every city and you know anything we can do to kind of help further your message and, and kind of promote your collaborative spaces and and get this sort of more sustainable, I think, efficient approach to design libraries going, let us know. We're really excited about what you're doing. Great. Thank you so much. We're excited to have you guys as a partner. Thanks, Emma. This is Jessica with Build Green, Live Green.